regulation after regulation. I think there are outdated regulations that need to be changed. New government regulations, which were created to protect employees. The regulations are... $1.8 trillion. There's a regulation that doesn't make any sense. Why do you keep Is this really the best we can do? Welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project's fourth branch podcast series. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Hello and welcome to the Federal Society's fourth branch podcast for the Regulatory Transparency Project. My name is Jack Derwin, and I'm Assistant Director of RTP at the Federal Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of our guest speakers on today's call. If you'd like to learn more about each of their bios and their interesting work, you can visit regproject.org to view their full bios. After opening remarks and discussion between our panelists, we will go to audience Q&A, so please be thinking of any questions you'd like to ask our speakers. If you'd like to enter your questions into the chat function, please feel free to do so, and we'll address them as time allows. Today, we're pleased to host a conversation titled, How Will the Biden Administration Handle China's Intellectual Property Practices? To discuss the topic, we're pleased to feature Mark Cohen, Justin Hughes, and today's moderator, Brian O'Shaughnessy. Brian, who will introduce our other speakers before we get started, is a partner at Dinsmore & Scholl LLP, where he chairs the firm's IP transactions and licensing group. Previously, he was president of the Licensing Executive Society in the United States and Canada, where he remains a senior vice president for public policy. Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jack. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today, and thank you all for joining us. We've got two distinguished and highly experienced panelists with us today, uh, Mark Cohen and Justin Hughes. Mark is the director and senior fellow at the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology at the University of California at Berkeley. He has served as senior counsel, China, in the Office of Policy and International Affairs at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and among other distinguished roles, has also served as senior intellectual property attache at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. So welcome, Mark. And uh, Justin Hughes is the Honorable William Matthew Byrne, Jr. Chair and Professor of Law at Loyola Law School at Loyola Marymount University. And from 2009 to 2013, Professor Hughes also worked in the Obama administration as Senior Advisor to the Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property. He, Justin has also served as the chief negotiator for various international treaties. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, kick off today's teleforum with a few minutes of remarks from each of our panelists, and then we'll get into some specifics with questions. So Mark, let's start with you. Okay, sure. So uh, the topic here is, where will the Biden administration go on uh, the Chinese IP issues? And I think probably the best place to start and to make sure we have kind of a common denominator is where the Trump administration was on Chinese IP issues. And that might seem like uh, uh, kind of a dumb question. Uh, uh, gee, we all know there was a trade war and there were a lot of sanctions that went back and forth and a lot of rhetoric and some very uh, uh, hot negotiations. But actually, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, uh, there was the phase one agreement that was signed in January 15th of 2020. Uh, and um, that agreement you know, uh, was intended to help lower the temperature, reduce some of the tariffs, but it was only a partial agreement. And in fact, there were many things that were omitted. And some of the things that uh, I, I think were kind of old wine and new bottle uh, uh, re-requesting, -re re-asking, recommitting to things that have been discussed sometimes for over two decades. Uh, but there were some good things there. Uh, uh, most significantly, uh, commitments on trade secret protection or forced technology transfer, uh, which may have been a little bit exaggerated in the view of some academics, but nonetheless, had gotten the uh, attention of many people around the world. Uh, and also uh, uh, commitments on substantive trade secret reform, on patent linkage, on uh, 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 some special campaigns, uh, uh, and on proving uh, damages in court cases, et cetera. So those those were all good things, but there were huge things that were not there. Uh, uh, and the Biden administration has to look now not only at how to populate its IP team, and thus far we really don't know uh, 
who will be leading IP related issues in the administration. We know some of the high ranking officials from some of the other agencies at the cabinet level. Uh, 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 but, uh, you know, USTR, for example, is typically a deputy USTR level position. We don't know the head of the PTO, uh, nor do we know what their perspective will be towards the Trump uh, uh, commitments, uh, 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 the phase one agreement, uh, how they'll handle trade related IP issues, whether the U.S. will get back into negotiating plurilateral trade agreements, uh, and whether they'll pick up on some of what I would call the orphaned issues, which I think were extremely important, like transparency in the courts, like compensatory damages, like dealing with high tech patents, uh, like some of the implementation issues in the phase one agreement, which are often unclear, whether the patent office will decide that there's infringement for patent linkage or whether it should only be the courts, for example, as, as one important issue. Uh, there were not, and, and to close this out, in my view, there were no real structural changes, notwithstanding the rhetoric of the Trump administration. And frankly, I doubt the Biden administration would be reaching for those kind of structural commitments unless it wanted to go into an even deeper trade war. But we may see more plurilateral engagement with China, perhaps if we uh, decide to turn on the lights in the appellate body at the WTO uh, or through other mechanisms. It's clear that this administration thinks we need to do things with our, uh, our partners on some of the hot issues in China, like in human rights. Uh, there are plenty of other China issues on the table. Uh, so how IP fits into the... Uh, uh, the, the chess game, if you will, with China on things like human rights, on the South China Seas, on Taiwan, on the coronavirus, on UN agencies, uh, on, uh, uh, um, on Burma, uh, on a range of issues. Uh, it, it may not be at the, at the top of the list, although I suspect it will nonetheless be important. Great. Thanks, Mark. Justin? Well, first of all, thanks, everyone, for inviting me to, to join today's discussion. Um, Mark and I have worked with each other a long time, and, and we generally agree on, on uh, most of these issues. And, and I will say, for anything about China, Mark is truly the expert, the expert, the expert, whereas I'm more of an amateur uh, who does international stuff. But um, I think the most important thing for people interested in IP in China to recognize is that for all its warts, what the Trump administration achieved um, in the last few years is a total reset in the Washington consensus on China. Through the Clinton and Bush and Obama administrations, we had had a Panglossian view that if you uh, simply bring China into the international trading system fully, and get them to adopt all these uh, property protective norms that eventually market forces will produce a greater system of individual rights and representative democracy and will have an amazing partner on the world stage. And the Trump years really forced a reset on that. And if you read foreign affairs and you read foreign policy, you realize that the foreign affairs community now accepts that no, that's not our immediate future with China. Our immediate future is, as President Biden has said, extreme competition. And in that extreme competition, uh, we need to recognize that uh, things like intellectual property are pretty much gonna be at the back of the bus in terms of important issues. Um, so I think that where we are right now is those in the business community who are interested in intellectual property and interested in it in China need to realize that the relationship is no longer primarily an economic relationship. It is now primarily a geopolitical relationship. It is perceived that way by Secretary Blinken. It is perceived that way by Jake Sullivan. It is a competitive relationship. And so if you're playing you know, the uh, guessing game of who will head the PTO or who will be in charge of IP at USTR, personnel doesn't matter much uh, in terms of the overall, where the overall Biden administration is going to be. Um, now, is that a terrible thing? Um, no, because I think the one thing you see that's different between the Trump administration and the Biden administration is that the Biden team realizes that even if you're in tremendous competition with uh, another power, 
that doesn't mean that all bridges are burned. It's not a scorched earth policy as it seemed to be a chaotic scorched earth policy as it seemed to be under the Trump years. So, you know, on the one hand, President Biden has said there'll be extreme competition, but on the other hand, he has said, quote, he's committed to pursuing practical results ended engagements when it advances the interests of the American people and those of our allies. And that's the kind of statement that really counts when we're looking at what market uh, will talk perhaps more about is that during the Trump's years, the USPTO wasn't allowed to engage in the normal kind of collaborative activities, the full range of collaborative activities it has with its Chinese counterpart, which is in fact a larger patent office now than the USPTO. And so intense competition or extreme competition doesn't mean that you can't have collaboration at those levels, uh, functionary levels and those um, working group levels where it can make a difference and it can make a difference for the business community. So pursuing practical results and oriented engagement sounds to me exactly what the PTO and the IP community wants to hear. And that's good because in China, we need to recognize that one difference between now and 2000 or 2005 is that there is just huge constituencies of Chinese business people who do care about intellectual property. There is a much larger, much more robust a legal community that cares about intellectual property. There's a much more effective court system for intellectual property. Those people have been a little bit adrift in the Trump years without having kind of American correspondence to work hand in hand with. So I'm hopeful that although we will not be going back to the way things were in 2015 or 2010, um, that, that we will see a lot more um, on the ground functional cooperation um, on intellectual property issues. So I guess I'll stop there, Brian. Ah, oh, great. Well, thanks, Justin. So in order to know where we're going, I think it, it might help to drill down a little bit on where we've been. And so we've talked a, a little bit about the phase one agreement. Um, it seems that the Trump administration uh, took a lot of heat and criticism for uh, perhaps overbalancing its approach uh, on a trade related type of approach. Uh, so, Mark, I, I'd appreciate hearing your thoughts a little bit more on the details of what the phase one agreement is and what your view is on its strengths and weaknesses. Sure. Uh, appreciate that question. So uh, the phase one agreement uh, um, is, you know, kind of a classic 301, you know, USDR type agreement uh, emerging out of bilateral discussions albeit one under uh, tremendous pressure uh, and uh, responsive a lot to, you know, the annual 301 reports from USTR, hearings and the like that come from industry and some uh, other pressures that I think the Trump administration uh, 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 generated on its own. And I don't mean that in a demeaning way. I think the Trump administration uh, was interested, as, as Justin mentions, in a total reset. Uh, and I think it's really important to note that the focus on technology that the Trump administration brought to the bilateral relationship was one that China always expected was a part of the relationship, but was really rarely a part of that discussion. So if you go back to 2007, when the US filed the WTO case on China's enforcement environment, there was nothing involving patents in that case, nothing involving trade secrets. In fact, nothing involving civil remedies. Uh, uh, it was focused on counterfeiting and piracy, You know, willful trademark and copyright infringement. So the Trump administration really brought uh, a new focus. I think this is really important to keep in mind because there is this assumption within the, the media, uh, certainly uh, even propagated by uh, Trump administration officials, uh, uh, that somehow the U.S. had been hammering China on issues involving uh, trade secret theft or or, uh, or patent infringement or uh, our standards or, or any other high tech related issue. And we had been getting nowhere. And the answer is really not. Uh, 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 if you go back to congressional testimony, 
15, 20 years ago when people said even IP theft, what they meant was copyright infringement and trademark infringement, nothing to do with technology. The tech community doesn't tend to be the most vocal on international issues. The trademark and copyright communities traditionally were, were much more vocal. So, you know, that was brought into, brought, brought out, the U.S. actually filed a WTO case almost contemporaneously with the 301 report on China's tech transfer policies. That actually went very well. Again, something the media did not cover. Uh, the case is suspended because China largely made the legislative changes we wanted, and I guess we're supposedly in some kind of observer status. Uh, and it, the phase one agreement was also selective. So you know, some of the really core issues to me, uh, 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 which would have some kind of structural impact uh, 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 in terms of China's IP regime are not there. Uh, the key one for me is transparency. Uh, I would put that as my first, second, and third choice, you know, uh, uh, because um, absent transparency, where you have the courts publishing all decisions, ideally publishing their dockets so that we uh, have access to information other than the final decision, uh, uh, it's really critical to know what is going on in the courts. And transparency in China, transparency in China is really a political act. Uh, courts may not publish cases because they're embarrassed by them, because they're too political, because foreigners lose, or they may publish them because they want to show how wonderful they are, how balanced they are, how thoughtful they are. Uh, and unless you understand that, you'd be unwilling to bring transparency into the political discussion. The other thing about the phase one agreement, and, and um, I'm a bit of a singular critic in saying this is that in many respects, I view it as a very uh, uh, socialistic type of IP agreement. Now, what do I mean by that? I realize it sound, may sound very grating to people who are on the, the right side of the political spectrum, uh, 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 favor free market forces, is that the, the administration, uh, and perhaps for the right motivations, although I think it was the wrong strategy, felt like the only way to change China around is by getting China's leadership to commit to certain reforms. Uh, and so uh, whether it was buying more wheat or U.S. products, or uh, reducing the trade deficit, or improving the IP regime, the focus is very much on public law and public mechanisms. So the phase one agreement talks about three or four special campaigns that China was going to bring to deal with counterfeit pharmaceuticals and, and software uh, uh, piracy uh, and, and, and counterfeit goods. Uh, uh, and uh, those are relics from 20 to 30 years ago, and they re-emphasize re the uh, uh, engagement of the state in managing IP. You get a fine for infringement, you don't get compensation out of those efforts, and frequently it's highly non-deterrent. Uh, and we had given up on those, by the way, around 2005 in the Bush administration, uh, when uh, several times the Commerce Department asked me, what should we do? China wants to have a special campaign. And I told then Secretary Gutierrez, you know, Mr. Secretary, uh, uh, another week, another campaign. If you need it politically, go ahead. But basically, this is non-durable, non-deterrent, uh, and it's inconsistent with rule of law. Uh, so uh, uh, you have really a structure out of phase one that relies, and this is kind of ironic, more, more on government involvement and management on both sides than almost any other agreement we had with China. Uh, 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 that is, you want to know what is happening in terms of a special campaign. Uh, you want to know whether China is bringing more criminal cases. Uh, uh, and there's no obligation to be transparent about these cases how foreigners are doing, winning, losing, whether they're getting damages, how big the fines are, et cetera, then you're just going to have to sit around a big table with your counterparts in the Chinese government from the U.S. government and say, OK, how did we do this past quarter? Uh, uh, in an effective, efficient IP system, what you do is you get on Westlaw or, or Lexis or the Chinese uh, 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 China Judgments Online, which is a big database, but incomplete, and you search and say, OK, you know, how are plain American plaintiffs doing on patent infringement cases? How many SEP cases there are in our standard essential patent cases? You would find today that actually the number of SEP cases, to give one example of a hot topic internationally in China, are but a handful. 
But that's based on published cases. If you want to find out how many cases there really are, you're going to have to call up every significant court in China, and you find out that over the past 10 years, it's been about 160. Uh, uh, but that's the kind of thing we did not get out of the phase one agreement. Uh, we're going to still depend on running around with sneakers uh, from one courthouse to another, so to speak, or, or making the phone calls or uh, 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 conjecturing uh, based on newspaper articles and, and uh, 10Ks and 10Qs, whether people are suing and what the consequences of those cases are. So in a way, for me, uh, I got a, a, the phase one agreement was a tremendous stimulus to other reforms in China. I, I also give credit to that. The China changed every IP law on the books in the past year or two. Uh, and there were many significant changes, many of them unrelated to the phase one agreement. In many respects, I feel like China did more outside of the phase one agreement than it did inside the phase one agreement. And that's one of the reasons I wholeheartedly agree with Justin that we really need to let some degree of cooperation, collaboration go forward because all these really interesting things have happened. Uh, incorporation of bad faith concepts into patent prosecution, trademark prosecution, uh, uh, a degree of discovery in, in IP litigation, reversals of burden of proof, et cetera. Uh, uh, but we have not been deeply engaged in them. Uh, 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 and what we do have is an agreement that uh, is a little bit awkward uh, to manage in terms of uh, our own goals, where we should be looking at you know, uh, uh, incentivizing private markets, letting the government have a much lighter touch on IP, whether it's enforcement or commercialization or antitrust. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, having greater transparency so individual companies and rights holders can understand what's going on and you get the government out of the business of managing what the public knows about its system, uh, but rather committing wholeheartedly to uh, letting the public be able to evaluate how well it's doing. Wow. Well, thanks, Mark. That's very illuminating. Um, so, Justin, uh, let's turn to you. So, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the strengths and weaknesses of the phase one agreement. Uh, but then if you would sort of take us uh, into uh, uh, a different perspective in terms of what does it mean going forward? Uh, how is the Biden administration approach likely to differ from uh, the approach that the, the Trump administration has taken? Okay, uh, well, um, I, I think Mark and I largely have the same analysis of the phase one agreement, but um, Mark just called it socialist. And I'm going to, I'm going to assume our federalist society uh, crew is uh, ideologically sensitive. And I'll say that the phase one agreement is not the most socialist thing we've ever done. It's the most statist thing we have ever done. And it's statist in the sense that, it, that could occur for many reasons. It could occur because Donald Trump had a vision of countries as giant companies, and he was in charge of one giant company, and Xi Jinping was in charge of one giant company, and let's just do a deal. Um, so, so what USTR did in the phase one agreement kind of fit with President Trump's mentality, but it's statist also in the sense that um, we, you could say the United States is increasing recognition of two things. One, we are dealing with a command and control society. We are not dealing with a society that is evidently moving in the direction of individual rights and market activity that we expected and was happening for a while. And second, um, Mark used the phrase, and we, we both know this really well, old wine in new bottles. Um, there is an abiding, very, very strong sense of Amer among American negotiators of, you know, the Chinese make a promise to you and nothing happens. And they make a promise again and nothing happens. And they make the same promise again and nothing happens. And, and I'm not saying that in a blame way, because there is actually, they're actually, you know, in one way of looking at it, the Chinese economy is command and control in another way. It is wildly uncontrolled. And, um, and so, but there is an abiding frustration. And I think the phase one agreement in its status form manifests that frustration with the U.S. saying essentially the enforcement mechanism is if we find that you are not abiding by any terms and conditions of this agreement, we can drop it at a moment's notice, right? It's kind of, we can cancel the contract at any moment. So, um, 
the other thing I'd say is while there, while the phase one agreement had things that did, uh, allow, um, China to push forward or some Chinese legislative and reforms to push forward. Everybody needs to know that the phase one agreement, if the Biden team wants to, can be treated as a dead letter because um, China had made, and this is prior to the pandemic, China had made tremendous state-driven commitments to increase U imports into China from the U.S., $200 billion worth over the 2017 importation levels, which were, which was, was considered the base year because that was the last year before trade tensions erupted. Um, and um, according to the Peterson Institute, China's 2020 purchases of products covered by the agreement reached only about 59% of the agreement's targets. And um, in some areas that was lower, some areas that was higher. Uh, in agricultural areas, um, the increase was only a 30% increase in agricultural purchases, whereas the Chinese had promised a 60% increase in agricultural purchases. So um, if the Biden team wants to, they can treat phase one as a dead letter, like we have to start over again. I, I don't think they will, um, but I also don't think that we're going to see any rollback on tariffs. Um, as Mark said, there's a tremendous amount of reform going on in the Chinese IP scene already. I agree with him. We need transparency. Um, but everyone needs to appreciate that developments of Chinese legislation and intellectual property and regulation and court developments are not something Americans have and have huge sway over under the best of circumstances can have only limited sway. And that's because there is a very large constituency for all IP issues in China now. And uh, also because there are other players. If you look where China has gone in a very small area of intellectual property called geographical indications, it's not what the US would want. It's what the European Union would be happier with. So um, there's a lot of competition for attention in the development of Chinese IP law. I don't know, Brian, if I even answered your question at all. <laughs> well, it, it was a great uh, commentary nonetheless, but I guess you, you, you referred to um, the possibility that the Biden administration might treat phase one as a dead letter and you don't think that it will. So, um, any care to hazard a guess in terms of how it's likely to treat the IP policies of its predecessor? I'm not sure there was much in the way of IP policies of its predecessor. Mark, do you think there was much in the way of IP policies? Of its well, well, you know, look on a, on a granular level, I, I, there are some interesting questions. There is a, a, this WTO case that was filed that I just mentioned. Uh, um, it's been suspended. Whether uh, the Biden administration will continue that case uh, uh, and/or file others, since they've talked about plurilateral efforts. And, you know, obviously all these kind of statutory changes that the phase one agreement brought out, you know, linkage, burn of proof reversals and the like, uh, they're, you know, available on a national treatment basis to all other uh, trading partners, most favored nation basis. Uh, uh, so there's certainly something that we could talk about with China. Uh, it doesn't mean that you require sanctions to do it. Um, uh, and I mean, I think it's hard I think it's hard for the Biden administration to back off of at least the rhetoric and, and some of the strategies absent some change in public opinion, impression, congressional oversight, et cetera, that says China isn't uh, stealing our stuff, stealing our technology, and is also uh, 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 poses a strategic threat. Uh, so I, I think there's an opportunity for the Biden administration to act smarter. Uh, I don't know if it can act that differently, though, and maybe it will be kind of a back burner, as, as Justin says. But, uh, you know, in, in the smarter category, for example, I, I would say if, if I was sitting there advising the president, um, you know, let's pick up on um, high tech patenting which was not in the phase one agreement. <clears throat> Let's talk about standards, essential patents, and what looks like an increasing weaponization of the Chinese judicial system. 
Let's talk about uh, uh, transparency and revive some of the dialogues around the judiciary. But, you know, not making it seem like we're getting soft on human rights and all these other issues is a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a, of a difficult thread, uh, a needle to, to thread there. But uh, I, I think it's possible, and I think it's been done before. Uh, uh, the U.S. Um, continued bilateral discussions, even when we filed a WTO case back in 2007, which was considered quite a threat to China. And they were, you know, about patent prosecution, trademark prosecution, and copyright issues, and uh, and the like. And it was largely done between IP office uh, to IP office, patent office to the Chinese State Intellectual Property Office, uh, 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 but also between customs and the DOJ and Chinese law enforcement on criminal enforcement, et cetera. And, and so I think those things can continue, and frankly, why shouldn't they? I mean, U.S. investment has continued in China. Uh, uh, the U.S. patent filings have continued in China and trademark filings. U.S. companies are suing and being sued uh, in China. Uh, uh, more and more cases on transnational in scope. So business needs it, and I, I don't think, and frankly, that it hurts uh, our concerns about rule of law. I think it helps if we can engage on those issues uh, where they're perhaps a little bit less politicized than, let's say, uh, whether there's genocide going on in Xinjiang uh, 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 and talk about things that really hurt our pocketbook. Uh, uh, I think it helps to say, gee, we want transparency. We want judges who are independent. We want to stop having the party make decisions on judicial cases. We want to really know what's going on with the cases that aren't published. Uh, we want to have uh, 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 clear standards that make it difficult to deviate from. We're really impressed with China's efforts to develop a case law system, which, which has actually been one of the more significant developments, which was intended really to thwart, in part, political interference and corruption, You know, make judges decide cases consistently with each other and explain why they deviate. All those things are really good, and they provide an opportunity to engage. And in a way, it was is given to the Biden administration on a silver platter because they were ignored for the past four years, and they're extremely important. Uh, so I, I think the Biden administration could do things smarter. I think it's pretty hard to be, to do anything if you're perceived as being weak on what might be uh, core issues or issues that are of great concern, uh, but uh, uh, it is possible to go forward. Can I jump in? I, I, yeah, actually, sure. I, I actually, you know, agree with Mark on all that. I, I think, though, the one thing is, you know, when you want to affect the behavior, any it, when you want to affect any structures, norms, activities in China, you have to decide at the level at which you're going to do that. So. Uh, Mark and I would probably agree that um, the, the thing about judicial independence and greater transparency in the courts is if Americans want to gently push that, they probably have an ally. And the ally are Chinese judges. Absolutely. Right? The judges would like to be free of party interference. And so as long as you don't do it in a way that you're smacking the party in the face, you mm. actually can exploit that kind of differentiation and in interest within Chinese society and, and work toward your end. Um, so, so, but also everyone should realize that uh, the United States' interest in IP uh, in China is not strictly what is best for American business. Um, and an example of that, which Mark knows even better than me, is uh, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office basically has a problem in its finances. And the problem in its finances stems from Chinese applications. And um, China has had a policy of subsidizing patent applications and some, uh, Mark, you know better than me, sure. subsidizing trademark applications. And for various reasons, which I could go into, I don't know if we have time, that creates a problem for the economic model of the patent office, our patent office as an agency, as a $3 billion self-funded agency. So, um, so what the US government puts on its lists of what we would like to get done in IP in China may not have, it may not be the best interest of US business one, two, three, and four. It may be other interests are in there. 
Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Uh, part of that is because the government was subsidizing applications and not maintenance fees or grants. So the result is um, you could file for a patent in China if you were a Chinese entity, to give one example, uh, and your costs would not only be covered, you can make a profit. Uh, uh, that is, the subsidies exceeded the cost of applying. The result is a lot of low quality patents. And in terms of overseas applications, the result has been a lot of uh, low quality, even fraudulent trademark applications uh, uh, that are not being uh, maintained. Uh, uh, and a lot of the revenue is in the maintenance of the applications. And frankly, you could, if you did, uh, uh, you did a chart, if you could visualize a chart of what Chinese trademark filings looked like in the US, let's say five years ago, you would see uh, uh, big bubbles of big companies like a Huawei, a ZTE, a HiR, whatever, as the principal filers. When you get back down to last year or so, you'd see lots of tiny bubbles, individual companies or uh, uh, filing one or two trademark applications, but thousands of them because they're all getting subsidies and they're almost all from particular localities that got the subsidies and whether they will be maintained or not, hard to say. These are not necessarily, by the way, abusive trademark filings. Uh, that's the problem that American companies have experienced in China, where you're you know, General Electric and you find someone else filed on the General Electric name. Uh, 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 these are typically, uh, in many cases anyway, uh, uh, trademarks that almost make no sense in English. You know, ZXYY uh, USB connectors. Uh, uh, you don't even know how to pronounce it uh, because uh, um, uh, uh, you know, they want to get a mark in order to sell on Amazon or Alibaba or whatever into China. I mean, probably some abusive ones in the lot as well, but, uh, uh, and they probably uh, filed the falsified specimen. In one case, the USPTO, uh, uh, there have been several of them, uh, uh, something like uh, over a thousand trademark applications were invalidated because the specimens would just Photoshop one to the other. They were never really used in commerce. And uh, not only that, the applicant, the applicant's lawyer, and was, uh, uh, I say that in quotes, was also uh, uh, disbarred from further practice before the PTO. And the PTO had to change rules about uh, pro se applications from overseas as a consequence. But, but these are also, you know, kind of writ large, and I kind of put on perhaps a too academic a hat when I say this, but bear with me, writ large, the, the, the bigger story here, it, it goes back to the same thing as a phase one agreement. This is an IP environment that uh, uh, whether you want to call it statist or socialist, has a very active involvement of the state in uh, managing, creating, protecting, commercializing intellectual property. And uh, it, it does not rely adequately enough on market mechanisms. And when you have huge subsidies going into trademark and patent filings, you're going to get low quality. You're going to build up frustration internally in China. Gee, we're the biggest patent office in the world. You know, I, I don't know, the numbers last year are probably six, seven times the size of the U.S. Uh, the mm -hmm. trademark office has been the biggest for 12 or 13 years. I said, how come we're still spending so much money on royalties from Qualcomm and, and Intel and wherever else, uh, Ericsson and, and, and Nokia, uh, when we have the most filings, the most SEPs, et cetera? Well, the problem is you've actually cluttered up the registers. A lot of that is junk, and we're, we're stuffed stuck trying to weed out the good from the bad. And I'm not saying China isn't innovating. I'm saying it's become, become much harder using patent information to determine how China is innovating because it's so cluttered up with other stuff. Uh, uh, and this is just another sign of what happens when you merge uh, mm. you know, a, a socialist, a communist economy in China. This is really interesting because if you go back to the TRIPS agreement and you look at Article 60-something, which talked about transition periods, it was expected that if you were a communist economy, and they were mostly thinking of Eastern Europe, you would need a transition period to embrace private property rights and understand intellectual property. It wasn't going to happen overnight. You're probably going to have to revive your civil code, your courts. You're going to have to break up uh, state ownership of land and factories, let people own their apartments. It's corporatized, state-owned enterprises, et cetera. No one thought at that time. And I think no one really thought through in 2001 when China joined the WTO what the consequences would be when a, a, an economy that is, whether it's uh, uh, you know, mixed or state dominated or has a big state imprint, would embrace intellectual property, not find it to be a foreign thing, but say, you know what? I can have five-year plans around this.
I can have a 15 year plan on this. I can talk about how I want to manage my technology purchases and sales. I can talk about how the patent system is going to benefit my core strategic and emerging industries or made in China 2025 or China standards 2035 plans. Uh, uh, that was utterly unanticipated. And, and we're seeing the fruits of that. Now, the, the smart people in this whole discussion, as best I can tell, who understood this or might have understood this, I think was a Hong Kong delegation to the Uruguay round because they inserted in the preamble to the TRIPS agreement that IP is a private right. Mm. Well, well, Mark, the history of that actual insertion in the preamble is the Hong Kong delegation did that because they didn't want to require, um, they wanted to create a presumption against uh, prosecutorial enforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to create a presumption that it was the private party that had to enforce their rights. But... But, uh, and Mark, I was going to ask you, tell us how you really feel. Uh, you're pretty. <laughs> um, All right, uh, just, I've just started, Justin. <laughs> yeah, but, 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 but you know, Brian, this is really, Mark, Mark is right, but this is really interesting because what happened is on this part, on this, on this kind of subsidization of patents is such a bizarre and interesting uh, story about uh, government, central government efforts, because um, some very thoughtful, people in Beijing realized that Western academics and Western analysts use patent filings as a way to try to measure, you know, knowing it was a very rough measure, innovation. Mm -hmm. and, and they responded by saying, okay, let's get more patents. Uh, and the result was a distorted system where patents are no longer as good a metric of innovation as they once were. Um, and, and that's kind of a bizarre feedback loop, uh, but a really interesting one. So, yeah, And Xi Jinping, yeah. in, a in a recent speech, and he said it 11 times, it was just published at the end of January, that they need to improve the quality of China's IP regime. This is going to be the, the issue for the next three to five years, as they've committed to back off of subsidies in the patent context, uh, in particular, uh, uh, and as they've also looked in terms of scientific work at improving quality and not simply quantity, because China has also flooded the world with scientific publications, uh, will China increasingly turn towards qualitative metrics? And how will that be implemented? And we're seeing that in scientific work where China increasingly wants to have a cohort of scientists who belong to that ultra high quality mega cited group. Mm -hmm. So that would mean, for example, providing laboratories to leading scientists, bringing talent back to China uh, uh, to do that. Not necessarily a direct subsidy for filing, for writing a scientific publication, but giving a lot of support to those people who will really set, lead the world to say, gee, China is really innovating and creating. Will that happen in patents? What will the consequences be? You know, is, is this going to be one of those things where we have to be careful what we wish for when China moves from quantity to quality? I can't say, but it's an interesting development. Wow. Well, Justin, let me come back to you for a moment. Um, so you've said that in the Biden administration, uh, the IP is likely to be a back of the bus issue. Um, at the same time, we've sort of taken task uh, of the Trump administration, taken to task for uh, a mercenary or tariff related approach. Um, is, is there likely in your view that the Biden administration is going to take a little bit more of a collaborative approach with the other market-based economies? And, and you've used the term uh, IP norm setting. Um, how are we going to sort of deal with China in terms of bringing them into what most of the rest of the market-based economies think of as typical IP norms? Well, the Biden, I mean, everyone knows that uh, Joe Biden is, is uh, in many ways, Joe Biden is, is, you know, an extraordinarily internationalist person to have been elected president. Um, when you think about his resume compared to Barack Obama's resume or George Bush's resume or Bill Clinton's resume, 
Um, and so he's obviously it's hardwired into his DNA to mix metaphors that for Joe Biden, that collaborative effort with our allies is, is what it needs to all be about. What can be done? Uh, well, again, I have to, I, I sound like a broken record, but you know, when it comes to the WTO, it's not that IP we've got to figure out. It, it, it's that the most fundamental issue we've got to figure out is how does the China-U.S. trade relationship, which right now is wildly, rapidly inconsistent with WTO rules, uh, how can it be made to fit as a sui generis relationship into the WTO system? And, um, and that's not about IP. That's about uh, a quarter of a billion dollars in tariffs that, um, you know, or billions of dollars in tariffs that the Trump administration put on that the Biden people are not going to get rid of. And whether or not the phase one, phase one agreement, if it has legs still going into the future in terms of the trade, the purchasing commitments was WTO compliant is another big issue. But that's going to be the first issue is, you know, if we believe, if our position is multilateralism and work with our allies, how do we take what we have done and without backing down totally, make it kind of fit into the system. And uh, that's going to take a while. At the WIPO, or the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is the other place where international uh, IP norms are formed and where a lot of important stuff happens in terms of uh, patent cooperation and trademark uh, called collateral filings through the Madrid system, um, the Chinese and the Americans are not you know, nearly as much as loggerheads as, as you would read from newspapers. So um, I, don't, I don't think that it will be hard to work with China um, in the WIPO, particularly what President Xi Jinping has said and what President Biden has said. I think that we will get functionaries working together. Um, but maybe, maybe I'm being an optimist about this or maybe colored by my past. I, I, I had a very tough night one night negotiating in Geneva and the Chinese delegate had disappeared and I called an American ambassador and it was very late at night and I said just call the Chinese ambassador wake him up and get the person down here and the person appeared and voted with us so um, so I'm not so I'm pretty optimistic uh, that at the functionary bureaucratic level a lot can be done collaboratively and we do need to do things collaboratively because China, let me just finish and say one thing everybody needs to know that when it comes to Geneva, when it comes to the World Trade Organization, when it comes to the World Intellectual Property Organization, China has this kind of intermediary position of wanting to be identified in the developing world, wanting to be perceived as a leader there instead of developing countries. Um, but on the other hand, you know, realizing that its interests are in many ways connected more aligned with um, the developed countries than everyone else. Sure. Well, if I can add something, I think Justin made some very good comments. I, I, I don't uh, personally view uh, the U.S. relationship with China, whether on IP or uh, on all issues, as a binary of collaboration versus competition. Uh, mm -hmm. and, may, and maybe, uh, you know, Biden uh, and his team are smart enough to recognize that, you know, there's a lot of space in that frenemy kind of uh, uh, calculation. And, and, and in terms of, of IP specifically, you know, I can see certain areas where, you know, there's low hanging fruit on multilateral cooperation, particularly things like export controls and CFIUS uh, 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 and building up, uh, uh, you know, alternatives to uh, China-based 5G standards or whatever. I, I, think, I think that all offers a lot, a lot of potential. Um, uh, you know, when you start uh, imposing unilateral sanctions against China uh, for things that might have been handled by the WTO. Uh, it's kind of looking in the rearview mirror uh, where we all have 2020 vision. Uh, um, uh, then uh, you know you you easily start losing uh, the possibility of plurilateral uh, consensus. I mean, the TPP was intended to set a, a new bar uh, and and in large part drawn heavily from 
our experience of engaging China uh, uh, to create uh, some plurilateral mechanisms. Interestingly, if you go to the WTO case, the U.S. filed uh, 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 around 2018, and that the EU filed a, a, a similar case a few weeks later, uh, there was about a, about a dozen countries that are uh, have joined that case or observers to that case. And I show that there was some kind of plurilateral interest in what both the EU, U.S. and EU were looking at. I, I think the WTO was abandoned as a mechanism too early by the Trump administration. There were a lot of things that could have been pursued were not whether we would come back to the WTO to pursue them or not. Uh, I, I don't know. I think that's going to depend on some of the things that uh, um, uh, uh, Justin just mentioned in terms of the sanctions uh, and where we want to go with unilateral mechanisms. But, but I, you know, I, I personally prefer if a perspective were taken of what is in the United States interest, not as what is in the U.S. interest in terms of a particular ideology or, 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 or effort to affect re regime change or structural change. What will advance our commercial interests in the short term and the long term? Uh, and in some cases, we may find China to be a willing uh, cooperator. In some cases, we may find other countries will work with us to put the pressure on China. And in other areas, it just may be uh, far too difficult. Um, well, if I may, uh, we've got a couple of questions uh, lined up in the chat in the Q&A, but uh, uh, one of our listeners asks if uh, you can address the Made in China 2025 initiative and how this is likely to affect the IP relationship with the U.S. Uh, Mark? Yeah, I, I, I should take that. But again, you know, I, I have to give the uh, the advance notice that the what the information I'm providing is my own opinion and is probably not the dominant opinion on, on Made in China 2025. Uh, Made in China 2025 was one of many IP uh, and uh, uh, manufacturing and industrial plans in China. You know, I mentioned made in uh, China standards 2035 as another one, the medium and long range science and technology plan, which is a 15 year plan, extremely important. The annual five year economic plans, the national IP strategy, which I think informed Xi Jinping's speech at the end of mm -hmm. January and the underlying law is up for revision this year, which is a science and technology promotion law and a wealth of dozens, if not hundreds or thousands of industrial and economic plans plans about the national and, uh, and local level uh, and sub-provincial level, as well as industrial sector level. So if you've only kept your eyes on Made in China 2025, you've been missing a lot of the landscape along the road to that destination. Uh, 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 and uh, some of them are far more important than high level, broadly worded national plans. The kinds of subsidies that are going to go into a manufacturing uh, uh, enterprise in Taizhou in Jiangsu province, which is trying to be a China pharmaceutical city, or the places in, uh, in uh, Zhejiang province that manufacture auto parts uh, or the kinds of uh, support that are being given for, you know, mega sighted researchers and in, in highly competitive technologies. Don't don't lose your, your eye uh, uh, on those really important issues. And I and that was frankly one of the reasons I differed with the made in China 2025 approach. I thought it was unduly e emphasized. It was overly broad and we were not looking at the range of other factors. Uh, China China incorporates IP into its industrial policies. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and if you haven't noticed that, it's been going on for a very long time. China never wanted to be the center of global counterfeiting and piracy, even though that may have helped lift its, uh, uh, its uh, 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 trade surplus some. Uh, it, it always viewed itself as being a major innovator uh, uh, and that it wanted to return to that status, which it had uh, before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, so, the, you know, the long range view of things, and if you've listened, to Xi Jinping's speeches over the years. Uh, it's often replete with references to 8th century China, 12th century China, China's uh, dominance in the world, China's trading relationships, China's scientific and industrial prowess uh, uh, with the last 400 years is a bit of a, of a, of a bleep uh, on that issue. You know, I, I had done... Um, some uh, experiments. So I was in the PTO, companies coming through with problems of various types. And we're talking about this was 10, even 15 years ago. And they would come in. I remember one company had a, a, a technology for a, a high uh, voltage transmission that uh, preserved uh, uh, the power over long distances. So it was kind of a low carbon technology. Uh, and uh, I said to them, have you looked up 
if there was an industrial policy in this area, because it would give you a sense of what your competition is and what China wants to do. And they already invested in China. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, there's probably a, a five-year plan or it's a 15-year plan or a science and technology plan or a local plan where you've invested. I said, really? And within five minutes using Chinese, I located a plan that was exactly on point. And I repeated that many times over. So if you're going into the Chinese market with a, a sense that this is all like Shanghai with all these skyscrapers popping up all over the place and people making millions overnight because it's a free market economy, you're probably quite deluded. Uh, uh, made in China 2025, uh, to the extent the administration brought it forward as an industrial policy that people need to think about, that was a good thing. To the extent people thought it was the only industrial policy, that was a very bad thing. Uh, those policies continue to exist. They also offer opportunities. So not to make it all of this ominous threat, but if you realize that China is headed in a particular direction on a particular technology and you own that technology or you have the possibility of being dominant in it, maybe you're a Tesla, maybe you're or a Qualcomm or a semiconductor company, uh, um, you may have a great opportunity in the Chinese market uh, 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 to uh, uh, sell, to manufacture, to conduct R&D, to leverage the talent, et cetera. Uh, and that could be extremely important. That works across many industrial sectors. Qualcomm did very badly in an antitrust decision that said it was charging too much for uh, 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 it licensing its technology. But once the National Development and Reform Commission said, you know what, X dollars per chip or X dollars per handset is the appropriate price for Qualcomm's technology, they were able to line up a lot of companies to license their technology. The state determined mm. that was fair. That was leveraging the state mechanism uh, uh, to set prices and determine what is competitive and to determine what is necessary for the Chinese economy in order to drive a positive outcome despite a very heavy fine uh, uh, in licensing technology. So it, it's a, a complex issue. Uh, it's something that uh, uh, fortunately, is highly transparent if you read Chinese, uh, 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 and that uh, you could leverage that uh, either for ominous uh, uh, consequences, and there often are ominous consequences, uh, or also for uh, uh, commercial opportunities. I would hope the Biden administration, uh, uh, whether it's through the science advisors or the PTO or USDR or uh, uh, agencies like NIH, the science agencies or DOE, pays more attention to these policies to understand competitive threats and does its own forecasting based on patenting and scientific publications and uh, R&D money and exports and, uh, and other uh, uh, efforts of China in order to come up with our own sense of what the competitive threats are from China in the future. Brian. Brian, although these are very complex, we need to try to really reduce them down to, to short answers for you. Um, and the thing about the Made in China 2025 in terms of U.S. policy is that, um, to me, the biggest problem is not IP issues. The biggest problem are subsidies issues. And the current international trade mechanisms to deal with this are totally inadequate. Um, the WTO subsidies agreement and the GATT uh, provisions on subsidies just don't address the kind of massive centrally driven subsidization in a mercantilist economy that in a, a continent sized mercantilist economy that we're seeing with China. So the United States needs to formulate a right response to the subsidization aspect of the Made in China 2025 and other programs of R&D and industrial development in China. And the problem is the WTO rules. Well, well, thank you both. We only have a, a couple of minutes left. You both have advised administrations at senior levels. Take a moment, if you would. I'll start with you, Justin. Um, if you had the opportunity, what would you tell President Biden about uh, what he should do with IP with respect to China? Well, let me start by trying to answer one question Amy Wang asked in the Q&A, and she asked, what was collaboration between USPTO and China counterparts on the ground look like in the past? Well, you know, one way you can collaborate is if you both get the same patent application, you can collaborate on prior art. 
and understanding what the uh, what the existing technology is. There's a lot of practical collaboration that can be done. So President Biden, on the ground for IP, to use your own words, there's just a huge amount of uh, practical results-oriented engagements we can engage in with China that we should do that will not detract from our appropriate moral and ethical positions on a lot of what China is doing in other areas. That would be it. Thank you. And, and what about you, Mark? What would be your recommendation and advice? Uh, I, I would, um, I mean, I don't disagree with anything Justin just said, uh, but uh, I would actually uh, not ignore, uh, uh, not underemphasize uh, the importance of investing in the right structures within the U.S. government. I think uh, even if you uh, brought on a brilliant U.S. trade representative or PTO director or, or others, unless you uh, can really integrate smart decision-making, uh, smart forecasting, and to U.S. government mechanisms, they're only going to be ephemeral. So in my mind, um, there are three things that are uh, uh, would make a, a difference from a structural sense. Uh, I would like to see uh, increasing depth and coordination on US, in U.S. government agencies on these issues, uh, and not just coordination and name only. Uh, people have to be incentivized to really work across agency lines. The China experts, the trade experts, the IP experts, the tech experts, the defense establishment, the economists, they all have to start working together. Uh, I think what we've seen in some of the policy making, not limited to the Trump administration, has been the consequence of, you know, the phenomenon of, uh, of uh, you know, a river a mile wide and an inch deep, uh, a lot of issues, but inability to go to a, a high level of depth. And that's what happens when you have uh, multiple agencies with similar portfolios, but limited human resources. People have to work together to share and work across agency lines. Training, uh, also uh, extremely important. The level of Chinese language knowledge is very low in U.S. government negotiators. And the level of Chinese law knowledge is extremely low. And that's part of the reason you have this phenomenon of constant frustration, because many times what we get out of China are commitments that are uh, uh, policy. Yeah, we'll work on improving X. And they're rarely expressed in legally binding language. Phase one agreement was a little better on that, but we really have to have a core of trained negotiators who understand the Chinese legal system, especially critical in IP, because it's an intangible right. This is very hard uh, to figure out what's going on. So coordinate, train, and the last thing I would say is plurilateralize. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that can be used effectively, whether it's WTO, plurilateral agreements, or specific issues like export controls. I think those are kind of the three institutional uh, uh, efforts I would like to see. Uh, uh, and if you were able to do that, then the U.S. could leverage what is a lot of talent in this country on China, on tech issues, on IP issues, certainly compared to most other countries, perhaps every other country in the world, except China itself. And if you could start leveraging that and educating our allies, we could all begin to move in a better informed and long-term direction. That's the only way, in my view, to uh, really create uh, 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 the roadmap uh, towards successful, uh, 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 smart engagement with China in the future, particularly in IP and technology. Well, uh, we've actually not just come to the end of our hour, but we've actually exceeded it a little bit. So um, this has been a fascinating conversation and it's obvious that this could go on for quite some time. And uh, so perhaps, a further follow-up would be in order, but I want to thank you both, Justin and Mark, uh, for your input today. It's been a fascinating conversation. I've enjoyed it tremendously, um, and and just thank you very much. So, Jack, I'll turn it back over to you for any closing comments. Thanks so much, Brian, and, and thanks to Justin and Mark for joining us today as well. I think it was a great discussion on a, a complicated but quite important topic, and we really appreciate you lending us your time and your expertise. Thank and you. A big thank you, thank to you. Mark as well for tuning in to today's live podcast. We welcome any listener feedback by email at rtp at regproject.org. And with that, 
we are adjourned. On behalf of the Federal Society's Regulatory Transparency Project, thanks for tuning in to the Fourth Branch Podcast. To catch every new episode when it's released, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spreaker. For the latest from RTP, please visit our website at regproject.org. That's R-E-G project.org. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 